And our lesson this afternoon, we're going to be dealing with, continuing to deal with what liberalism has done to the church. Because uh, while we often hear speaking about liberalism and the evils of it, uh, and those lessons are needed and necessary, yet we need to realize what has it done to the church. Uh, and so we started looking at that, and the very first thing we looked at is that it perverts the Word of God brings about a growing disrespect for the Word of God, the Bible. You see that in so many congregations today. If you want to get a great illustration of that, just go and start talking about the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage and that there is only one reason that God allows for divorce. And if someone divorces for some other cause other than that, they continue to commit adultery. See how much respect people have for what Jesus says in Matthew 19 and verse 9 and Matthew 5.32. But that uh, growing disrespect brought about a, uh, what was referred to as the new hermeneutic in which there had to be a new way to interpret the Bible. Uh, I thought it was interesting in our Bible class this morning, we were talking about uh, Paul being Mercury, uh, the people there at um, Lystra, I think that's what it was, uh, thought that uh, Barnabas was... Zeus or Jupiter, and Paul was Mercury. The Greek word, though, was Hermes because he was the speaker. He's the one, Hermes uh, was the one who interpreted what the God said for people. Well, hermeneutics comes from Hermes, the Greek god, or Greek mythology god of Hermes, in that it is the science of interpretation of the Bible. And so, they thought we need a new way to interpret the Bible. The idea of, as they would call, sinning, uh, commands, uh, examples, and necessary inference. Actually, the proper terminology would be direct statements, examples, and implication that that was passe, that was uh, not worth uh, looking at, and we had to have another way of interpreting the Bible, and so they considered, well, we'll just interpret it as a love story uh, without any commands, without any orders or anything else, just a love story from God to man. And thus, with that came a rejection of any pattern theology, there is no pattern in God's Word. Well, if there's not, then why really study the Bible? Uh, and so we have seen within the Lord's Church less and less study of God's Word. Well, with that comes a... causes men and preachers in particular not to preach God's Word. There's no longer that bold presentation of the Word of God that sets forth sin the wickedness, the evil of sin, in clear, distinct terms, uh, and takes the Bible out of sermons, don't use too much Bible, fill the sermons with short stories and moral platitudes, feel-goodism, and the preaching of Norman Vincent Peale of how to win friends and influence people became the prevailing type of preaching that was seen even within the Lord's church. This leads to a perverting of the Lord's church itself. It makes the Lord's church simply a denomination among all the denominations. 
Now, the Lord's Church is, of course, not a denomination. It never has been. It stands opposed to every denomination. But in the minds of many, the church is nothing more than a denomination. And thus, we lose any distinctiveness that we might have had because we're just one among many. Thus, we start seeing a perverting of the, work, of the worship of the church. There are many congregations today who are putting women in leadership roles within the church. In spite of the teaching of 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2. Then, there is a change in the music of the church. We had one congregation, and then another, and then another, and it's become being more and more prevalent, where they would bring a mechanical instrument of music into the worship assembly. Some, they were real big, or and some of them not even all that big, would decide, we'll have two services. We'll have a traditional service and then a contemporary service. And the contemporary service, of course, they would bring in the instruments and all of that, while the traditional, for all those older people who still believe the Bible, uh, will have that traditional service. As if that would somehow alleviate their sin of bringing it in during this contemporary service. There's also been the aspect of the Lord's Supper, where some have taught that Lord's Supper is just a common meal. There's no distinction between eating a common meal and taking the Lord's Supper. And they would argue that, well, the Lord's Supper was instituted during a meal, the Passover meal, and so these two are joined together and you eat together, you have the Lord's Supper uh, along with that meal, and there's no distinction between them. And thus, if that's the case, then any time we get together, we partake of the Lord's Supper as well. And thus, a taking of the Lord's Supper on any and every day and of the week. Or, as one person argued, uh, when they got married, they took a Lord's Supper. And that wasn't on a Sunday either. But the Scriptures, of course, show that it is to be done upon the first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 7. But also, liberalism not only perverts the worship of the church, it perverts the work of the church. The work of the church is that of saving souls. In a Facebook group, I asked two different people in a discussion that deals with what we're talking about this, morning, this afternoon. What is the work of the church? No one answered. They didn't know what the work of the church is. The work of the church, very simply, is singular in nature. It is saving souls. And if you want to know the name of that group, because it's interesting, False Doctrines of Men. Uh, <laughs> we're to save souls. That's why Christ left heaven's home to come to this earth, was for the express purpose as he puts it in Luke 19 and verse 10, to seek and to save that which was lost. The church has that exact same mission, saving souls. Now then, that saving of souls we see is to be accomplished in three different ways. Because number one, you have those who are lost. They need the gospel preached unto them that saving power of Jesus Christ so that they can obey that gospel and thus the salvation of their soul. There's those who thus who have then obeyed that truth. They need the edification and the building up that goes along so that they will not lose their soul and they will be saved in that uh, thread and where I ask what is the work of the church, I was asked, 
that is, the work, uh, is keeping a, an instrument out of the building, the work of the church? And my answer was, absolutely. Now then the reason was, and I explained it, because that will cause people to lose their soul in hell, and thus it is the work of the church in saving souls to keep it out. My, the answer to that was, I disagree. <laughs> There's the edification, though, the building up, the strengthening that needs to be done within the church so that we don't fall victim to things like unto that. That's to save souls. When we don't edify and build up, that's the idea of edifying, to build up. We don't strengthen those who are already saved, then they're going to be in danger of going back into sin and falling back into that evil way and their soul being lost. And so there is that need for edification then there is that need of benevolence. Benevolence should never be an end of itself. In other words, I'm giving just to give. Benevolence has its intent, the saving of souls. And if we don't remember that in our benevolent work, then we're losing the advantage of what benevolence is all about. And so, benevolence is not simply giving people what they want, because they can want a lot of things. I recall a man coming in uh, and asking the elders to buy him a motor home. That was here. Paul remembers it very well. And when they refused, he left in a huff and said he would never return, but he did, and he asked again. He wanted that motor home. It's not providing the wants of people. Benevolence is you have a specific need there in a person surviving, being able to live like they're supposed to live. And so the meeting of that immediate need, but the purpose is so that you can teach them. Uh, you see that many times even within the life of Jesus. John the sixth chapter is a great illustration of that. Here they are. They're without food. He feeds them, but he teaches them. And so there was the meeting of that need to feed the people, but there's the teaching that went along with it. The purpose of it was the salvation of souls. Yes, it was meeting that immediate physical need, but the purpose behind it saves souls. Uh, sometime, if you want to get into a good discussion with a lot of people, what was the purpose of miracles? Was compassion, showing compassion, purpose of miracles? Well, absolutely not. It wasn't. Did Jesus show compassion by performing miracles? Yes. But that was never the purpose of the miracle. The purpose of the miracle goes back to that of revelation and confirmation. The revealing of God's will and confirming that which has been revealed by God. That it is the truth. And thus bringing about faith on the part of those individuals. In that performing a miracle for that purpose though, there was often compassion shown to individuals. But that Compassion was never the purpose of it. Now, I say that from the standpoint of the work of the church because what we'll talk about in May is the aspect of a lot of people get the view that showing compassion and being benevolent to others is the work of the church. In reality, the work is dealing with the salvation of souls. And you meet it immediate need, benevolence in regards to that individual so that you can discuss their soul with them. You can teach them and get them to obey the truth. 
I've seen individuals who believe, and supposedly members of the church, who believe that the church needs to provide them all of their living. Anytime I get in a bad spot, well, the church needs to bail me out because that's the work of the church. And that's all that they see as far as the church's responsibility. But that's the idea of what liberalism has done to the church. Because it changes the church from its one purpose of saving souls to doing other things. Years ago, well, going back to the 1800s, German rationalism comes along, and it primarily started in Germany, but uh, it spread other places. And they started denying anything miraculous within the Bible. Resurrection, it didn't really take place. Well, how do you explain the resurrection then? Well, it is a resurrection of ideas or a resurrection of the thoughts that Jesus had presented. They didn't deny the existence of Jesus. They just didn't believe he was God. They didn't believe any of the miracles that he performed. And thus, what is the resurrection? Well, the resurrection is the resurrection of his thoughts that were going to be presented by the apostles. And you would go on and on with this idea. But this goes back, and I introduced that from the standpoint, if the miracles don't take place, they don't exist, the resurrection is non-existent, at least from a physical, bodily resurrection, then what is the purpose of the church? Of what value is it? You see, the very aspect of saving souls depends upon the fact that, yes, man has sinned, man needs salvation, but why does he need salvation? Because there's going to be a resurrection in which we stand before God and we're judged. But wait, if what gives us any evidence that there's going to be a resurrection? How do I know that? The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. Because he was raised... I know we will be raised. That's what Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 15th chapter. Because brethren there were denying the bodily resurrection. And so he says here Christ is, he was raised and he becomes the first fruits. Well, first fruits was the guarantee that others will be raised as far as resurrection is concerned. But if there's no resurrection then what about salvation? You see, there's a problem now. Because salvation from sin, as far as what the Bible teaches, as far as sin is concerned, and heaven and hell, eternity, if those don't exist, then what's the purpose of the church? Thus, a social gospel started being presented. Now, this was in the scholarly people, but it finally trickles down, just like today. You want to get something started, get the professors in the colleges to start teaching it. The doctors who are teaching it to those who are becoming doctors, who then go into the regular universities, and they start teaching it to the students there, and then after a while it permeates. Well, that's the way this happened. It started in these schools, and they started teaching it there, and after a while it starts infiltrating the common person. Well, a social gospel. In other words, you deal with, and religion is the purpose of it, is to deal with the problems that man faces. Now then, when I say problems, understand we're not talking about the problem of sin as revealed in the Bible. But problems that we face within our lives. People are out here hurting. 
Some of them are alcoholics. So what do we do? We're going to appeal to those alcoholics to try to get them to stop being an alcoholic. Women's suffrage. Going back to that time frame in which uh, women were finally allowed to vote. Well, a lot of the religions got on board with that because they considered that to be the work of the church. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that is what was taking place at the time. The churches felt like it was the responsibility of the church to solve this social problem of women not being allowed to vote. And so they got along and became supporters of this social issue. The uh, Salvation Army started during that period of time. In this same aspect, dealing with social problems. You had people out here who were poor, who needed things, and so what are we going to do? We're going to get on board and we're going to have our red kettle out here now, in which people go by and put money in so that they can give to the poor and help the poor. Why? Because that is the work of the church. It's not the saving of souls from a spiritual standpoint. It is a saving of the physical aspect of man. As time went on, dealt with war. We had the First World War, the Second World War, and then you see Vietnam and, or Korea and Vietnam and and what do you see? All of these religions are jumping on board in relationship to dealing with the war. And, of course, during the Cold War with Russia, all of the nuclear weapons. And you get the churches jumping on board in relationship to the evils of nuclear war. And having all of these ICBMs and all of these other types of nuclear armaments. Why? Because in their mind, that became the work of the church. Because you have these social ills, and their gospel was not a gospel of salvation from sin, in which you save the soul of man for an eternity in heaven, but it was to alleviate the problems and the sufferings of man in this world. Why? Because... Going back, they started teaching that there is no resurrection, no miracles. And if there's no miracles, there's no resurrection. And if there's no resurrection, there's no judgment in eternity. So what's the work of the church? It has to be dealing with this world. That's why there has been a redefining of sin. Things like homosexuality, it's no longer sin, it's simply an alternate lifestyle. But before that, you had, for example, the committing of adultery. Well, that's just having an affair. And on and on you could go. Alcoholism, it's not sin. It's a social disorder. You know, it's a disease. In which, and so sin is redefined from what God has established as sin, a transgression of the law of Christ, to these social disorders. And thus, what became sin is things like poverty. War is sin. Pollution. Well, that's sinful. And how many times do we hear about we're going to destroy Mother Earth? Why? Because this Earth has become God instead of God. But then also, 
to deal with this idea of social gospel, what eventually happens is that the gospel and the church it becomes nothing more than a social club to deal with social problems. So what do we do? Well, we start meeting and we start hearing this phrase, we need to meet the felt needs of people. Meeting the needs of man. Uh, thus, what do we do? Well, because a lot of people don't know how to handle money, we're going to have a seminar on handling money. Money management. And because of all of the stress in our society today of doing this and that, we're going to have seminars on stress management. How to cope with worry. And we start having all of these types of seminars that deal with the social problems that man faces today. You see, again, it's not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and trying to save souls. It's trying to teach people how to deal with and interact with our society today. Then in the church as well, what we start doing is we turn inward. And we start providing recreation for people. These young people don't need to be out on the street because they're only going to get in trouble out on the street. So what do we do? Well, we provide something for them here at the building. Well, uh, what do they want? Uh, well, they want to play basketball, so we're going to build a gym, a museum out here. But some of the older people won't like that because they still believe that the work of the church is that of saving souls, so we'll just call it a family life center. I know of one congregation who built a gymnasium based upon that, and then when the members found out it was a gymnasium, they were surprised by it. They didn't know that they were building a gymnasium, but that's what it ended up being. They thought it was going to be a family life center. congregation that it happened to is in Oklahoma. <laughs> How many others were like that? One elder presenting their building to someone, a preacher, took him into the gymnasium and they would pull chairs in for their worship assembly but the gymnasium was the feature part of it, and he said, we want to p people to know the emphasis that we place here. Their emphasis was on recreation, not upon the teaching of the truth, not on saving of souls. It becomes nothing more than a social club that we can attend if we want to, or we can skip if we want to. Why is it that we have so much trouble with so many congregations where they will have a certain number, let's just say for discussion's sake, they're going, they will have a hundred people there on Sunday morning, but then you come to Sunday evening service and they'll have maybe about 50. And then you go to Wednesday and they'll have about 30. Why? Because worship is something that we can skip or we can take it or leave it. Why? Because it's nothing more than a social club. And just as in a social group, I can take it or leave it. I can be there or not be there. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to affect me one way or the other. That's the way in which the church is then viewed. Because they have perverted the work of the church. And so now then, we see congregations with all of these different programs and when many times an individual moves into another area and they start calling around, well, what programs do you have? 
What are you going to do for me? And don't tell them, well, we're going to teach you the gospel, and we're going to try and get you to be working in the Lord's kingdom. Yes, but what are you going to do for me? Because they want programs and programs and more programs that are going to be given. They're going to want their, for example, what is so many times provided in, our, in the church today, woman's night out or men's night out, daycare centers in which we're going to take care of your kids for you, or some, you have date nights in which just drop your kids off and you, husband and wife, go out on a date. Well, is that a good? Yes, it probably is. But it's not the work of the church. Trunk or treat is provided by so many congregations now during Halloween time. So we'll provide candy for all of the kids. Why? Because we want to be a social club that hands out all of the candy. And supposedly that's going to get them to come to worship and get them interested in spiritual matters. Or singles ministries, which many of those are nothing more than come over here and commit adultery. Find you a husband or wife, even though you've been divorced, find you a husband and wife. And so, singles, but they call it a singles ministry. And on and on and on that it goes that we see within the Lord's church today. Why? Because we've changed the work of the church to something that it's not. Rubel Shelley is quoted as in uh, the Tennessean, which was a newspaper. It was an article written by Kerry Ferguson in 1992. And he's quoted as saying, We are at a junction in history where the church should listen to the unchurch about what they're telling us about us. Don't listen to God and what God says about us and what we are to do and what we are to the work that we are to be engaged in. But listen to those people who have no spiritual knowledge, no Bible knowledge whatsoever, and we listen to them so that we can learn what we need to do. What we need to provide for them. That has become the reason that you have the community churches nowadays. Because they have gone out and they've determined, here's what people want. And so we're going to provide this for them as far as what they want. But the problem is that people who do not know the truth don't know what they need. They might have their wants, but what they need might be totally different. Again, in John the 6th chapter, when after Jesus had fed the people there, he leaves, goes to the other side of the Sea of, uh, of Galilee. They follow him, and he tells them, You're seeking me, not because you saw the miracles and believed, but basically he says, Because you got your bellies full. Because you're able to eat the food. That's the reason you're seeking me. And then he goes into a long dissertation that chases all of them away. None of them remain except the apostles. And then he turns to them and he asks them, are you going to leave also? You see, these people who had followed Jesus to the other side of the sea, who had been fed, they knew what they wanted. Jesus knew what they needed, and they didn't care what they need because of what they wanted. 
He gave them what they needed, and they left. They ran away. And the apostles, when he asked them, will you also go away? Peter's response, to whom, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You see, the apostles had learned, here's what is needed. Here's what is really important, eternal life. And the words that Jesus gave were words that would lead to eternal life. The thousands of people that were there following Jesus, I guess Jesus was very unsuccessful because, as far as what we would consider today success because he goes from a congregation of thousands to a congregation of twelve in a matter of hours. Why? Because he told the people what they needed instead of what, giving them what they wanted. We need to learn what's important, and that is the saving of souls. Not to provide the wants of man, not to become socially oriented, but to look in God's Word and realize here's what is of true value and true want, or true need. And then to present unto man that saving gospel of Jesus Christ, because that's what's important. Now, to save someone from their souls initially, they have to obey the gospel. Now, and that, that's going to be predicated, yes, upon their faith, their repentance. And repentance is getting out of sin. Not necessarily getting out of poverty. Poverty is not sin. But you, if you listen to a lot of the churches today, poverty is sin, and so we have to get everybody out of poverty. Even though Jesus said, the poor you, you will have always with you. Always going to have poor with you. Well, it's not necessarily getting them out of poverty. It's saving their souls, getting them out of sin, getting them to repent of that sin, to leave the sin to follow God, making that confession of faith, and then changing their state from one who is a sinner to one who is a Christian. And that changing of state takes place in the act of baptism, where they are saved from their, soul, from their sins. And then they are to live in the way in which God set forth. Now then, if we, when we fall, we sin, God provides a way to escape that sin. By our repentance, praying to Him, we can then be saved. When have those sins washed away. And it, we're told that God is, faith, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but that's predicated upon if we confess our sins, 1 John 1 and verse 9. And so if this afternoon you need to obey that gospel, we would encourage you to obey it. Save your soul from this untoward, this wicked generation. If you need to repent and come back, then we encourage you to obey to do those things necessary, to once again have your soul in that relationship with God to where you will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So if we can help you along those lines, we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.